Um, next speaker uh, will be Ray Norris, uh, who's a uh, research scientist at uh, CSIRO in Australia. Um, as uh, appropriate for radicals, he's been redesigning his talk throughout the meeting. Uh, the title he now tells me is Astrophysics 2 and the Undiscovered Einsteins. Um, Ray is a uh, uh, graduate of uh, uh, Cambridge undergraduate, Manchester for his PhD. Uh, then uh, Ray was recruited uh, as part of the Bob Freda uh, uh, searching uh, the world for any clever people that could be found. Uh, to come to Australia, join CSIRO Division of Radio Physics, and became involved in the building of the Australia Telescope. Uh, he's quite famous for uh, realizing that the two biggest telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere, the Park 64 meter and the uh, Tidbin Billa 70 meter space tracking telescope, could be connected in real time to make an interferometer, uh, now famously known as the PTI. So Ray went on with many involvements in both the computing and the astrophysics. He led the astrophysics group in the Australia Telescope for a long time. Uh, again, like good radicals, he has other, other, uh, other sides to him. He's also, I would say, now the uh, Australian expert on uh, Aboriginal astronomy, uh, publishing papers uh, uh, on uh, the interpretation of Aboriginal customs uh, relating to their study of the sky. So if you want fascinating information, talk to Ray about that. It's probably not part of the title, but God, who knows with Ray. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Ron. Uh, I, actually, I'm going to start by, I've got two of my mentors sitting here, so there's Ron and Bob Freighter, uh, both of whom had uh, an enormous uh, influence on my career. Um, Rad has never been a mentor. I first remember meeting Rad, I think I was a PhD student at Drottle, and you seem to be like I've never met a guru in my life. You seem to be like a guru. It was the first time I'd seen a, a real live Indian guru. And, um, and with, I've, I've only ever interacted briefly with Rad over my career. But every time I interact with him, we, you, know, you have a few sentences of conversation. And then you go away and think about it for the next year. <laughs> I don't know whether you realize you have this effect on people. And, and you have this enormous effect on lots of people, I suspect, in this room as a result of just a few sentences of conversation. So uh, thank you, Rad, and, it, and it's a great honor to be here today. OK, astrophysics 2.0 and the undiscovered Einsteins. Um, right, well, this is actually, uh, Bob Fraser the other day was uh, talking about castles in the air and the need to think about the castle before you build foundations. You probably don't know there's an academic reference to that, Bob, which is here, Hammerstein itself. Um, so the dream, you've got to have the dream until you've got the dream, you can't start making it come true. And uh, that's what a lot of this talk is about, about having a dream. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to say a bit about how astrophysics works. Oh, by the way, astrophysics, astronomy, whatever you prefer to call it, my, I prefer to call it astrophysics, is very fuzzy, the difference. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about something I call astrophysics 2.0, which will become clearer. And a, a bit about the web and finally, about how we find those undiscovered Einsteins. So uh, we heard a bit this morning about Popper and Kuhn. Um, my apologies to those of you who already know all about this. Um, when I was a high school student, I was taught that Karl Popper had shown us what science is really about. And science is really about coming up with a theory. You do an experiment to test the theory. If you falsify the theory, that's good. You go and build another theory if you confirm it and you devise another test. And that's what real science is. And we see that happening. Things like the LHC are a perfect example of that process. So Popperian science, the science that Popper talked about, clearly does work. And now it's often seen as the gold standard of what's good science and uh, also generates questions. People criticize string theory because string theory doesn't fit into this. String theory doesn't produce falsified predictions. And so some people said, well, therefore string theory is not science. And all familiar with this. But um, what, and uh, I apologize, people, this is absolutely obvious, but it appears not to be completely obvious to everybody uh, that actually the philosophy of science has moved on a little bit since Karl Popper. 
and Thomas Kuhn, who we heard about this morning, the inventor of the paradigm shift, um, pointed out that actually Popperian science is a good way of doing science, but there's lots of other modes. Exploration, understanding, insight, and paradigm shifts, of course, for which he's famous. And astronomy in particular doesn't often work in a Popperian way. So often in astronomy we work in a, a mode of explore, exploration. You've got all these other ways, experiment theory, surveys, numerical simulations, which obviously don't fit into Popperian science. So if we take perhaps one of the best known astronomical discoveries, the um, HR diagram for stars, Two guys, Hertzsprung and Russell, said, what if we plot the colors of stars against their brightness? And they did that plot. There's no theory guiding them. They just thought it'd be a cool thing to do, and they did it. And they found this main sequence going up there, and that really started the process of people understanding how stars work. So this wasn't a question of a, a theory being tested. It's two guys going out, taking data, plotting something against something, mining data, we'd now say in modern parlance, and then other people developing that and coming up with all these other types of stars which laid the foundation. And then you get the theory, which works out how it all works. And a lot of astronomy, not all, a lot of astronomy works in this mode. Okay, this is all preface um, to uh, what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. Uh, Hertzsprung and Russell were not just data gatherers. They were people who had an idea of things to do with the data, interesting questions to ask. There's as much creativity going into asking what bits of data should I take, what's likely to, you know, my gut feeling is there's something going on here, I want to test that, I want to go and look at the, the uh, look at the data. And this is happening more and more in astronomy. So if we look at the process of doing science in general, I guess most people have seen this, that when you get data, you don't, not actually learning anything about the world. You go to them go through a process, you get your data, you try to extract information from it. From the information, if you're lucky, if you're good, you might actually get some knowledge. If you're really good, you might get some understanding. And if you're really, really good, you might get some wisdom. In the case of astronomy, telescopes give us data. We then reduce our data and we get information. We learn about the stars, the brightness of the stars, whatever. We then do some analysis. We think about the data. Think about what it means. We might decide to plot brightness against color. And that actually gives us knowledge. We've then got this beautiful plot. We now know something about the stars. And then we go out. We compare it with what other people are doing. Look at models. Look at theory. We publish papers. And at that stage, we start to get some understanding of what this all means. And at some point, in meetings like this, we have these fantastic discussions. And maybe between us, we actually generate some wisdom. And we come out from this meeting uh, better than we came into it. Okay, so that's all just background about how astronomy works. And I'm just going to give you another little aside before I get into the talk proper. And many people will be familiar with the terms Web 1.0 and Web 2.0, but for those of you who aren't, I'll just explain it. So Web 1.0 is the traditional web. It's Google, it's Ned, it's ADS, it's the AppJ Online, and the web 1.0 is about somebody somewhere put something on the web so everybody else can see it. It's one person or a few people providing information to many people. And it's really good. It's, that's the backbone of the web. It still is. The, the other thing we see more and more is web 2.0. And what people call web 2.0 is things where maybe a company or an organization puts some tools on the web or some infrastructure. And it's up to us the people, to put the information in there. So the obvious example is all the social networking sites like Facebook. Face, the company Facebook, all they do is write some software. And then Facebook gets populated by the information that some of us put on Facebook. Uh, perhaps more useful, Wikipedia. There uh, have been a couple of references in this uh, meeting to things on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is populated by people like us. We write the articles on Wikipedia. We do it for our peers. And Web 2.0 is all about peer to peer. It's many people providing information to many. OK, so what's this got to do with astronomy? So the analogy I take is that just like Web 2.0 is opening up the power of the internet so anybody 
can put stuff up there. You don't need to be a programmer to do it. Uh, Astrophysics 2.0 is providing tools to open, opening up astronomy. So you might not have time on Keck or the VLT, but maybe some guy who has got time puts his data on the web, and you can access it, and maybe you'll have some insights which he didn't have. And Astrophysics 2.0 is about putting stuff on the web which enables other people then to contribute. It's many to many. So, coming back to the subject of this conference, what Astrophysics 2.0 does, it opens up enormous power to the hands of those few radicals who are ready with bright ideas and maybe don't have access to the data or the information or the telescopes they need, but they've got the ideas, they've got the intellect, they've got the nurture, maybe they've got the nature around them. What they want is access to the information, and Astrophysics 2.0 can give that to them. So how is it different from um, Astrophysics 1? And now, this isn't something I'm preaching, by the way, Astrophysics. This is something that's actually happening, whether or not I say this. So if we look at the way astronomy is be being done right now, there's a growing focus on large surveys. So we all know about Sloan. You know, we all hope that our, the object we're interested in falls in the Sloan area so we get good redshift, good spectroscopy. We see large amounts of data being placed in the public domain, like Sloan. That it used to be the case 10 years ago that people took their data in their telescope, they hugged it to their chests carefully, they spent their entire careers trying to pry some information out of it. And there's a growing tendency for people to put the data on the web because they know that the real science comes from when they compare their data with other people's data. And so by exposing it to everybody, you actually generate much more science than you would by holding it to your chest. We need tools. Uh, virtual observatory. Um, it, it's interesting. If you go around astronomers and you say, what do you think virtual observatory? Uh, a lot of people say, well, I like, I like it when I see it. And then you say, well, um, how many of your students use Sinbad or Topcat? And I actually asked a group of students. About half of astronomy students, at least in Australia, use Topcat and Sinbad. Most of them aren't aware they're using the virtual observatory. The virtual observatory is here. We're using it every day. It's something that works. It's a set of tools for accessing all this data. We're seeing a reduction for proprietary observing and data reductions increasingly automated. So the role of telescopes is changing. Increasingly, people don't go to the telescope. This is just a statement of how it is. I'm not saying plus or minus yet. I will do. Um, next generation telescopes, and I'll say a little bit about ASCAP, the Australian SK Pathfinder, but only as an example of next generation telescopes, will never be visited by users. ASCAP sits out there in the desert. The closest the user ever gets to it is accessing a database of results. And that, that's becoming increasingly true. We shouldn't be surprised. Not many people visit the Hubble Space Telescope, right? I mean, it'd be crazy. Uh, and we, increasingly, we realize that it probably doesn't make lots of sense to visit some telescopes on the ground. And instead, the job of these telescopes is to produce data for everybody to use. So this is the SKA Pathfinder. I'm, I'm not going to say very much about it. I'm not going to be plugging the SKA Pathfinders or ASCAP. This is the Australian SKA Pathfinder. But to, just to use it as an example, the data volumes it's producing, 70 petabytes a year, right? 70 million gigabytes a year. You aren't going to put that on your laptop. You aren't going to be processing with apes. There's just no way that any mere mortal can cope with 70 petabytes. You have to automate a lot of stuff. So the operation of the telescope will be automated. The data reduction will be automated. automated. Even the source extraction, we hope the cross-identification of the wavelengths, all would be automated so that you, if you're an astronomer, you just get to use the data or the information and you're a little bit down that track for producing information wisdom. And the data will all go in the public domain, which would have been very unusual 10 years ago. It's becoming increasingly common. So not just ASCAP, the South African, South African SK Pathfinder, Meerkat's also doing this, and, and others are as well. So just see how this all fits in later. OK. What this plot shows is all the existing large radio surveys. So all, for people who are not astronomers, surveys the way we examine the sky. Um, it's um, in botany, if, or if you're a biologist, 
how would you start without knowing, having the flora, knowing what plants there are? And this is what this is about at the moment. In this phase of astronomy, we're trying to figure out what's up there. And so if you look at all the surveys at 20 centimetres radio, so I've plotted sensitivity along the horizontal axis and what area of the sky is covered up there. And so at the top there, we have the VLA Sky Survey, NVSS, which is an absolute workhorse for most radio astronomers. It covers 75% of the sky. It's done at the VLA, and it's one of the most, and the paper with the NVSS, one of the most cited papers in astronomy. Um, that's the largest survey that's ever been done of the sky. At the other end, down here somewhere, uh, is uh, uh, an observation by Fraser Owen of the Lockman Hole, and that's the deepest image that's been made, and he just spent uh, a large amount of time in the VLA looking at one pointing, looking right back at the early galaxies in the universe. And we have all, all the other surveys in between. And you notice there's a, a diagonal line, and that's basically determined by how much time you can get on a conventional radio telescope. Oh, by the way, the one atlas there, means that, that's my own uh, project that I'm working on at the moment, and we're just tiptoeing across that line a little bit. Um, but I won't say very much about that. Um, so what about the next generation telescopes? At the moment, the whole radio astronomy community is gearing up for the square kilometre array, the next generation telescope, which will be built in 10 years or whatever. But at the moment, we're building a number of telescopes, which are called SKA Pathfinders, telescopes which are designed to check out some of the technologies, some of the science we'll be doing in the SKA. So there's a number of SKA Pathfinders being built at the moment. I showed you earlier the Australian SK Pathfinder. Uh, another notable one is Meerkat in South Africa, which will also be a very powerful telescope. If we look at, oh, sorry, and so really, if I just go back a second, what I meant to say, is that all our knowledge about the radio sky are from these surveys and others like them. And there's this great area up here of unexplored phase space. We know this diagram is populated with discoveries. We don't actually know where they are. We don't know the density of discoveries. We can sort of do some extrapolation. It's probably wrong. But we know out there are discoveries. There's pulsars or quasars, things like that, waiting to be discovered out there. And the, if you want to make those discoveries, you've got to move some of these surveys up there and find out what's out there. And so that's really the area that the SKA Pathfinders need to be looking at. And so if we look at... Um, so on ASCAP, we have the EMU survey, which I'm leading, uh, which will indeed try to do that. We're going to be doing just like NVSS, but going much deeper, just because the design of the telescope, using these checkerboards that Ron Eakers was talking about earlier. We can look at much larger areas to go at once. But here are the, are the, is the MITEI survey. This has been done with the South African Meerkat telescope. And you can see that EMU in Australia and MITEI in South Africa and down there between them, they really populate this area very nicely. We, s we need to sample that white space to find the discoveries. And between them, these telescopes do that in a very nice way. Now, just another aside here. People sometimes assume that because I'm Australian, well, of course I want the SK to come to Australia. I'd be crazy not to. And they therefore assume that I'm going to badmouth meerkats in South Africa and say how wonderful ASCAP is. Well, it ain't like that. Actually, I'm here to do science. And although Australia and South Africa are quite correctly competing in a competitive process to get the SK to their two countries, and we're both building these pathfinders, that doesn't mean to say you have to compete at this level. The people involved in these projects are doing it for the science. And so rather than competing, uh, ASCAP and, and Meerkat actually collaborate quite a bit, which seems to surprise some people for some reason. And so, in fact, the EMU project, which I lead, uh, the PI of this project is, one, is on our team, and I'm on the team of the MITEI survey using Meerkat. There's a lot of suing and throwing, and in particular, we'll share tech development of techniques. Uh, there's no point reinventing the wheel. Ultimately, you want that science to work, and ultimately, we want SK to do the best possible science, and that will depend on getting these things working. Okay. Are these just the numbers? So with... So, that, yeah, okay, I will spend a moment on this. So this, is a, this happens to be our project, but this is just a typical next-generation project. We're going a couple of orders of magnitude deeper 
than the previous NVSS survey, which is something you expect to do when you're doing new science. And we're going to turn up 70 million galaxies in our survey. All right, that number's important, so I'll come back to that. I'm just using this as an example of a next-generation telescope. So we're going to have a catalog of 70 million new galaxies, which is a factor of 35 more than the total number of radio galaxies known at the moment. Right, oh, and SKA, of course, is just going to blast us all out of the water when it gets going and go right up there, up to the ceiling somewhere. Okay, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, these surveys, that's just a, a part of the Atlas survey. It's a small fragment of what EMU will see. And every dot you see there is a galaxy. Uh, about half of those dots are older than about 5 billion years. We're looking right back in the history of the universe. Some of those dots there, we don't know which ones, some of them will be within a billion years after the Big Bang. And so with these surveys, we're able to probe. And if you blow it up, you'll see all sorts of interesting galaxies, which we can use as probes for the ways that galaxies form and evolve, which is what the science is. OK, data reduction. So we've got this, these fantastic surveys. We've got to reduce the data to turn the data into information. Um, when I was a student, like many people here, I guess, I first thing I had to do was to write the software for the telescope. Oh, of course, Ron had to dig the trenches for his telescope. That was a few years later for me. It was writing the software for the telescope. Um, and some people still consider it a virtue for PhD students to spend, spend hours editing data. And I consider this a bit like going back and digging trenches. Yeah, it's probably good for you in some way, but there's actually other things you can be doing which are also good for you. The other thing is that inexpert users reducing data tend to do it worse than an automated algorithm. Expert users can generally do it better, but novice users won't. And so with things like ASCAP, all data reduction has to be done on the fly. We don't, we've got too much data for people to do it by hand. And then you need in humans when a human brain is needed rather than getting humans to do dumb manual tasks. So the advantage of get doing the data reduction automatically rather than getting humans to do it is subjective. You don't tweak the data to fit your favorite theory. It's re reproducible. It incorporates best practice. There's some hot new algorithm, some's developed. It takes a few years for people to find out about it. Or turn you find a bug in an algorithm, it takes years before people stop using it. Uh, algorithms can be updated by people who really understand this stuff. Graduate students can start working with real data very quickly. It means that students start thinking about the astrophysics of what they're doing rather than editing data or writing code or digging trenches. The bits that I'm going to start talking about more and more is that it also means that you've got some kid in an Indian village who in principle has the intellectual resources, perhaps has the education, is able to do something with data, but in the old model would only be able to get his hands on data like that if he or she uh, got a place in a good university or a good research institute. It means that people have access to really good data regardless of where they are or who they are. There are disadvantages. So I, I know that there'll be people in the audience saying, but, 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 and th yeah, these are true. It reduces familiarity with the data. It means that you're going to miss problems in the data. You might do stupid things with the data. And there might be unexpected science that you completely miss. And yes, there are these problems. We can't ignore that. And I, I think that the advantages that you get by automating it outweigh these. Clearly, it's something you debate. OK, so let's look 20 years ahead to how people might be doing astronomy. So. We have these big survey telescopes. I've shown a radio telescope that thinks the same thing's happening in the optical and infrared. You imagine now we've got these enormous surveys, many, many petabytes of data. Most of that data has not been mined. There's too much data for any human being to go through and look at every galaxy. So whereas at the moment we know there's lots of interesting discoveries making, made up in the sky, by in 20 years' time there's going to be lots of data sitting on spinning disks and there's undiscovered things in there. So my guess is in 20 years' time, most astronomy is going to be doing by mining these surveys. Of course, there will still be l large specialized telescopes which are really 
uh, like the uh, Fraser Owen thing of the Lockman Hole, there's still a place for stuff like that, obviously, but it's not dominating astronomy as it tends to at the moment. So, a typical observing run in 20 years' time, you decide what you want to observe. This one might not be a source, it might be, I want to look at the radio emission from red radio quiet quasars. It's a class of objects. So you go to the database, you run it across correlation. And the ingenuity that at the moment is being put into trying to figure out the key experiment which is going to solve dark energy or something, maybe that same ingenuity is going to be saying, how do I ask the key question to mine that data to find out how dark, how dark energy works, whatever. And then sometimes, yeah, you need to go deeper and then you go back to the telescope. But most astronomy is probably going to be done on these databases. So let's look at some of the data challenges. Um, so this is not the future now. This is now. This is the telescope being built right now in Western Australia. We know we're going to have lots of gigabytes to handle. We know we need lots of teraflops to process the data. We need a petaflop. I don't think a petaflop computer exists yet. It might just. Uh, enormous problems with power. Uh, we, our power requirements for the processing are like a small town. And we absolutely have to do pipeline processing. There's no way you can get PhD students to analyze 70 million galaxies. And this is where the telescope we're building now. For SK in 10 years' time, you need to multiply all those numbers by 100. So it's significant data processing problems. Most people are familiar with Moore's Law. This is a, an extended version of Moore's Law due to George Joukowsky. This is the Moore's Law that people talk about. Basically, computers get faster and more powerful every 18 months, something like that. Actually, you can take it right back. You've got mechanical relays there. You've got thermionic valves, tubes there. And you see this. It's not quite a power law, but uh, it's an increasing doubling time. Let's go back to whoops, the radio astronomy era. These are, where are we now? We're 2010. We're up here. And there is the fastest computer in existence. So, yes, there are petaflop computers. The, this is the 500th most powerful computer in the world, it's that line there, and that's the sum of the total computing power in the world. So right now, with ASCAP, for example, we're down here, we're just developing the thing, but by the time we get going, we need to be up here. So that's the most powerful computer in the world, this is the 500th. Uh, for ASCAP, we'll probably be having the most powerful computer in Australia. By the time we get to SKA, we're on the line of the most powerful computer in the world. That's going to be a significant challenge. So, astronomical commuting, computing is getting astronomical. In astronomy, um, if you look at the amount of data that's been produced, that's got a doubling time of about 1.5 years at the moment. So the amount of data we're generating is also increasing very rapidly, which is why uh, survey data has now completely overtaken conventional data. And the data sets are much more complex. You have much more information. We would call polarization as a matter of course and so on. Okay, and so I'm going to skip this actually. I think I'm spending, no, I'll go through it very quickly. I'm spending too long on this. Um, and so you have the telescopes, which are the primary data providers, providing all this data. And you have people doing most of their astronomy here, working with that data. And then you have the space telescopes and things for specialized niche astronomy, which is pushing the really interesting science going deep. So the sorts of questions you might be asking when you're doing astronomy is doing correlations between properties or stacking, taking lots of examples of a type of source, averaging them up so you can push the sensors right down, doing interesting cross-correlations to measure things like dark energy and, and so on. Okay, how else is it? So that's how astronomy is changing. How else? Publications. So publications are changing. Um, right now, you can publish a paper in good old astrophysical journal, which you all love. And, um, and librarians generally will have a paper copy in their library. Um, at the moment, um, AppJ, a year's AppJ is about a meter. So a library has to build a, an extra meter of shelf space every year. But that rate is increasing. It doubles every 30 years. So in 30 years' time, you have to have two meters a year. And that rate keeps on doubling. So after 1590 years, the shelves have been expanded at the speed of light. 
So clearly there's something wrong here, and what, what's wrong, there's two things wrong actually. One thing wrong is the assumption that we produce paper journals, and in fact, App J is soon going to stop doing a paper edition, and it will just be on the web. Actually, I won't go quite yet. Um, and the other thing that's wrong, in a more fundamental way, is do we, should we really be doubling our number of publications every 30 years? Are we really generating more science at that rate? And I suspect the answer is no. Um, so, our current publishing system isn't perfect. We have a peer review system, which is sort of variable. So the idea for people, I think everybody here is, maybe not so strong, but practicing science, in case there are people in the audience who aren't scientists, so the system is, if I submit a journal, there's a, there are checks and balances to make sure I'm not publishing rubbish. And the check and balance is that it gets sent to two of my peers, picked to be fairly experts in that field, and they get to criticize my paper. And generally, most referees are really helpful and because we are the referees as well. I guess referee other people's papers and so on. And so it's in our interest to make the system work. And yet, sadly, sometimes some referees aren't very helpful. Um, one problem is that mediocre papers are much more easy to produce than good papers. So good papers, things like saying that the theory of relativ special relativity may be wrong, <laughs> will be very, very hard to publish. It's going to be ex examined very carefully in people's reactions. This, this isn't what I was taught at school. This must be wrong. Whereas if I publish a paper saying, here's yet another boring image of this slightly interesting galaxy, and it might be useful to somebody, and the referee will read it, find their own mistake, saying, yes, that's fine, that can be published. And so our current system actually in encourages mediocre papers. But the argument says we don't have uh, alternatives. One problem is that uh, we increasingly are run by bean counters. My salary now is determined partly by how many papers I generate, and so there's an incentive to me to produce a large number of mediocre papers, which is not good. Uh, and I think we're seeing this, that the number of papers is increasing, but there's less science per paper. The various people have done studies where they've tried to estimate the amount of science, and yes, it is increasing, but not as rapidly as the rate of increasing papers. And one result is that the really good papers get buried in this mass of mediocre papers which nobody really wants to read, which will never be cited. And so there's a problem of accessing the good papers. So here's a suggestion. So app J 2.0. I'm not sure the app J people like this. So let's suppose anybody can publish a paper. Just at the moment we have archive, Astro PH. Effectively that happens, but it's not refereed. We do need a refereeing system. We need checks and balances. Suppose we, so I write a paper, I put it on the web, anybody can post comments. So rather than a formal um, anonymous refereeing system, we have a, a system where people can actually, with their, sign their names, they say, they can say, I think this paper is great, I think it's rubbish, or yeah, good paper, but you've got an error in line too, you know. Um, and both favorable and anonymous comments will be carried along with the paper for other people to see. And what we're seeing with social networking is that things bubble up or bubble down. And I think this will actually work. The good papers will rise to the top of the pile. You can look at people's scores, like on eBay, and you can read the papers that week which got the highest scores that other people found interesting, maybe in your own field. Anybody can rate the paper, and most of us will look at the highly ranked papers in our field. And then you hear through the grapevine of a really interesting paper, which maybe has done a widespread appeal, with, which is good in your area. Do you know if it's going to work? I don't know. But you've got to try these things. You don't know whether it's going to work until you try it. You can sit, sit here theorizing for days, and you can't work out whether it's going to work. The only way you're going to find out if it works is try it. I think we should try it. Another problem with the current system. If I publish, I get my Atlas catalog, and I publish it in AppJ, and I think, oh, that's good. It's going to appear in... NED. Now, people aren't astronomers. Uh, NED and Simbad are two databases, data centers, which are very widely used. Most astronomers will be accessing these, like, every day. And so, if, I, if I'm studying a galaxy, I go to NED. NED is the NASA extragalactic database. I go to NED, and I just see it on a page, all the, all the work that's been done on that galaxy. All the spectra, all the images, all the photometry, everything that's been written about it. Wrong. Actually, that's what PhD students think. Actually, when I go to the page of my favorite galaxy, I've got maybe half the stuff that's published on that galaxy. This is, a, this is not a criticism of NED or, or Simbad. 
which are both fantastic. It's a criticism of our current system that it's not actually practical to get every published result in a galaxy into a day space. It takes a lot of human work to dig into a paper to find out if a galaxy is in there. And this is a problem. We don't actually have access to all the data we should be able to have access to. So what we need to do is provide authors with a set of tools to enable automated capture of this data. So when I put my table of data into my paper, and I say, these are the K-band fluxes, the guys in there, they don't wear K-band? So radio astronomy, K-band is 20 gigahertz. So don't forget astronomy, it's 2.2 microns. And the literature's full of all this stuff, which means nothing without context. So instead, I'll go in and there'll be a tool which tells me to fill in the metadata properly, and then it can automatically captured. Um, it's another idea. It's an idea that's been seriously proposed. The journals aren't so keen on it. Um, so what do we have to do to make the journals keen on it? Um, we use peer pressure. We, without us, the astronomers, they go out of business. And um, OSDS did a trial run of a system like this and found that 30% of authors participated from a cold start, which isn't bad. So the next IU General Assembly in a couple of years' time will be putting up a proposal asking the astronomical community to ask the journals to set something like this going, and then we'll automatically get all our data into the data. And we need things like this if we're going to get to astrophysics 2.0. Okay, I'm rabbiting on. What about existing use of web 2.0? Okay, Facebook. Um, how many people here use Facebook? Mm, third, I suspect. And it's nearly always the younger people. And there's, and there's people who want to be young like me, you know. Um, Facebook is sometimes condemned as a total waste of time. Um, I've seen Facebook being used by one of my junior colleagues saying, I'm processing the source in Myriad, and I'm getting the result. Has anybody seen anything like this before? Now, if you put that onto the help desk, you might get a week, reply a week later. She puts it onto Facebook. Within minutes, half a dozen people said, oh, yeah, I saw that, or uh, whatever. And you might even get somebody expert coming in and say, yes, the way you fix that is that. It's a very good way. You've got this closed community. People typically have maybe 100 or 200 friends who are typically working in the same area and who typically are doing the same sorts of things. You've got a lot of peer knowledge there. Twitter, another total waste of time. Who wants to send tweets to people? Well, do you know the IEU telegrams are probably going to be discontinued? The old system just isn't working. The funding's not there. So how do we do it? Well, actually, right now, you can go to Twitter. Go into Twitter. Go to VO event, and you'll find all the IA telegrams there. They're all sent out as tweets. Uh, so these things are really useful. Skype, we all use it. Video conferencing. How come we've got all this fantastic technology, and we still don't have a decent video conferencing system? It's, we've got to get this to work, and uh, especially carbon credits get serious. But there is one thing which almost works, and that's Evo. If people haven't used it, I'd recommend it. Evo.caltech.edu. It's a public domain thing. You have to download a, a bit of software onto your PC. But it's very, I found it's the best system I've used yet. You have half a dozen people all around the world. You've got pictures of them on your laptop, and you'll talk. Second Life. Now, I won't ask how many people are on Second Life. How many people know what Second Life is? A few, a handful. Okay. So Second Life is a game. It's a game where you, you have to make an avatar. You use uh, controllers in your mouse uh, to move the avatar around. It can interact with other people. You can buy clothes or records. You can have conversations with other people. And it's a total waste of time, right? No, not necessarily. So George Tchaikovsky has set up something called the... Um, Meta Institute for Computational Astrophysics, MICA, which exists only in Second Life. You can go there. If you're on Second Life, you should go and visit it. Just, just do a search. And they have colloquia. And people go along, and so these people don't use Second Life. These avatars, that might be you, in the, or that's probably the speaker, actually, in the blue jumper down there. But you will move your avatar along. You'll go and join. You'll sit down. You can see the PowerPoint on the screen. You can ask questions. You're actually interacting with real voice, with real people. You can make comments to the guy sitting next to you. At the end of the coat, you'll walk out, and you might be chatting to the person next to you about whether the talk was any good. Just like real life, almost, except you've got this bloody stupid avatar. But other than that, apparently, 
Uh, George says that people typically get four or five, take four or five hours to get up to speed. So it's an investment. Just see if it works. You, once people take that investment and they join these meetings, he says it actually works, strangely, much better than video conferencing. People actually do interact with other people there, even though they're stupid avatars and you can't actually see who is who and so on. It works. So we should make, be making more use of this sort of thing and for conferencing. Okay, now the other thing is that you might be some kid in an Indian village and you're really interested in what have you got on there? Ha halos and globular clusters. You're a kid in India and you've heard about, you've Googled on halos and globular clusters. And you want to find more about it. You find there's a colloquium on that afternoon by the guy who's actually spent his life working on these. And you go along and you join it. Maybe you don't understand all of it. Maybe it goes over your head. But we all know, we've all been in that situation as students. You actually gain an awful lot from going to colloquiums you don't necessarily understand. So maybe there's a young Einstein from India. Or maybe there's a young autistic spectrum Einstein. Somebody who's living in the middle of LA or Sydney or London, but actually has a problem with interacting with other people. And Second Life, uh, there are a large autistic, so I'm talking about people with Asperger's and things like this, who have trouble interacting with other humans. But on Second Life, people break down these barriers. There's a large population of autistic spectrum people on Second Life. And there's a lot of proto-Einsteins out there who probably do suffer from social disorders or, or, or autistic spectrum disorders who would actually mu be much more comfortable here than in a real university. Okay, another problem. How am I doing for time, Ron? Pardon? Oh, right, okay. In that case, I'm going to s almost skip this. Right, I've always finished. Uh, so in ASCAP, uh, in our galaxy project, I said we're going to detect 70 million galaxies. To get the science, we've got to combine them with other wavelengths. Okay, about 10 million of them, we're not going to be able to do that. About 50 million, I think we can do with an intelligent, probably neural net processor. And there's 10 million, and they're the really interesting ones where we can't do it. We actually need a human being to actually eyeball them, look at this galaxy, compare it with other things, and we don't have 10 million grad students, so we have a problem. Um, so we want to tap into a large number of minds. There's a thing called Galaxy Zoo. Ha hands up, who's seen Galaxy Zoo or know, knows it? Oh, quite a few, okay. Um, Galaxy Zoo, for those of you who don't, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a real tool. This is doing real science. This isn't outreach. It's sort of outreach but it's doing real science. It's a, an attempt to classify all the galaxies in the Sloan survey. So you, as an in inexpert user, just Google on Galaxy Zoo, go in there, and you can play with it. And you'll be offered an image of a galaxy and you'll be asked, is this more like this or more like that? Is this a spiral or elliptical? If you reckon it's a spiral, okay, is it a bar? Does it, which way around does it go? How tight is it? And all the questions you're asked are packaged, so you don't know, have to know anything about astronomy. But the net result is that all the Sloan galaxies are being carefully classified. Now, of course, you get people mess around and so on, and there's checks and balances to make sure that doesn't happen. Actually, every galaxy gets looked at by, by about 20 people. And you get, they get the distribution of answers. There's a quarter of a million people regularly use Galaxy Zoo. And the Sloan people are using this to do real science. This isn't outreach. This is the only way you can get these galaxies classified. So we're now working with the Galaxy Zoo people to do the same thing with radio data. And uh, we're about to do a, a trial run on our existing Atlas data. So there's a whole load of this citizen science stuff. Uh, you may be aware of other tools like that. Potentially, this allows you to tap into brain power of people around the world. It allows you to tap into people who might not otherwise be engaged in science, but who would like to be. It provides a route for non-scientists to get involved. And this is cutting-edge research. This isn't some piddling little outreachy thing. So I'm not, I don't mean to be rude about outreach, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and then sometimes people find unexpected objects. There's a lady called Hanny something, I don't, can't remember her surname, in the Netherlands who found Hannah's I'm not going to try to say it because my Dutch, I can't do a Dutch accent. Raw whip. I know it's not that. Object. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Hannah's object. That blue thing there. Completely unexpected. So she was going through. She's a high, high school teacher. She's going through just for fun, classifying these galaxies. Found this really odd thing. I brought it to the attention of the Galaxy Zoo staff who are astronomers. And now they've got a couple of papers out. And there's a few examples now of real science being driven by members of the public. What about finding the undiscovered Einsteins, which I'm actually supposed to be talking about? 
I'm going to skip all this. We know all this, don't we? Nothing will ever become of you, is what one of his teachers said. But the point is that Einstein didn't... Okay, he went to uni, went to university. He didn't do very well. He got uh, a dead-end job as a patent clerk. He couldn't even get... Couldn't even get promoted. His supervisor didn't think very much of him. And with hindsight, probably a lot of this is probably not good interpersonal skills. And yet he had a, you know, this guy was the brightest guy on the planet. And the year after he failed to get promotion, he published his fam famous special relativity paper. So Einstein was lucky. He made it. How many other Einsteins are there out there with brains just as good, maybe a problem with social skills, maybe unable to get an education, maybe in some village somewhere in a developing country, who would really like to be part of science, but is prevented from getting into it by all the barriers we put up. Um, forget about equal opportunity. Totally pragmatically, as somebody running a research project, I want to access their brain power. I want to do science better. I want to be access to all those brains, people who want to do science. So how can we access the young Einstein's? Can we go further than Galaxy Zoo? Don't just ask them to classify things. Can we pose real problems in such a way that you don't need a formal education? Obviously, you're going to need to have internet access. Obviously, you're going to have to, have, have to be literate. Beyond that, you can imagine a lot of young people who are very bright, who can't access science in a conventional way, can't get into university or can't do a PhD, but actually really bright. And we could offer them a way to get involved in front, uh, front cutting edge science. And I think the web now gives us the tools to do this, but we've got to figure out, our challenge is to figure out how to do it. And in the case of the really, if you really found a real Einstein, presumably you'd then want to offer him or her mentoring or studentships or whatever. So I'm going to stop there and leave that as a challenge for all of us. We've got to figure out how to do this. Thank you. Question, Roy. Uh, name a list of papers that are important results gained only through the web. Um, my memory is not that good. Give me some notice. That's a reasonable challenge. Um, no, you don't know how bad my memory is. Um, <laughs> uh, well, what would you mean? This, this Henny's Bullwhip, the one he just mentioned. The one he just mentioned, Henny's Bullwhip, that has at least. Yes, it is very important. It has about three publications, and you ought to keep up. <laughs> no, so what, 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 what sort of... Six months ago. What sort of paper are you after? I mean, um, so when you say through the web... No, no, no. no, no so it's a good question. I, I actually want to answer it. So right now, people are doing work on Sloan, for example, just cross-correlating cross data and finding new objects. There's lots of papers out there. There's lots of stuff being done in the deep fields. There's people sifting through all the ESO deep field data and finding really good stuff. So, yeah, there's stacks of stuff out there. No, I don't have a list I can recite to you. But, yeah, I, I think there's stacks. Ray, Ray given the, uh, what, what you're talking about here, a lot of the universities now go in for distance learning. Now, as far as nurturing and bringing people forward, how, would you, how, could, how could we do this in astronomy, distance learning at different institutes, how could they in integrate that into their, their program? Yeah, that's a really good point. So I think we have to. I mean, there's a subtext to your question is, should we? And yes, obviously. So if you can get those outreach programs and then merge them into things like this. And there are groups that are doing this. There are groups that now, not just in distance learning, but there's high schools and university courses which are using Galaxy Zoo as a teaching tool. So that's already happening. I think as you provide the tools like that, that will happen almost of its own accord. But we need to work with those guys. Who are, and particularly people like NASA who have fantastic outreach programs. The only, the only thing I can see that, that, that would hold me back on some of this, I think there's a great deal of, uh, of goodness in actually bringing people forward that, with hands-on that can actually build equipment and things like that. This is purely knowledge-driven. How would you bring in making equipment or bringing people forward that can actually do hands-on hunting, making instrumentation? I, I think that's much harder. So there are programs that people, well, you, you know, there's people using six-inch telescopes to look for transients and things like that. There's a certain amount of that going on, but I think that's, well, A, the kid in the Indian village isn't going to be able to lay his hands on a six-inch telescope. So I think there's, it's harder, I think. 
you can't do everything. Michael. I hesitate to say this, but um, as well as the young Einsteins that you mentioned, who uh, uh, have poor social skills and so on, who don't get on very well in the present system, there are people who have very good social skills yes. and get on very well in the present who aren't, aren't very good. Right. So and and they're the, they're the analogue of all those mediocre papers that are published, but who, which obscure the good ones. So <laughs> with the schemes that you propose on the web, I mean, you do run the risk of vastly increasing the mediocrity. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, although I think it's a good idea what you're saying, I mean, it should be tried, as, as t t taking your point. One does have to be careful that the, 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 the landlines aren't totally obscured by the mass of mediocre Twitterers and, uh, uh, and Facebookers. Yeah, you, you're right. Uh, uh, actually, I tried to cover that to some extent there, but, um, but there are people, there's a, a guy I know who's a CEO of a defense company who wants a hobby. He's really bright. He wants to, so I'm now working with him, to, he wants to ramp up in astronomy in his spare time. I, he, I think he's, so he's not down here, he's not in Einstein, but he's certainly up here. And I hope we're going to end up having papers in this collaboration. But. Uh, no, I think I have serious doubt about how this is going to work because it's okay for automated data reduction and so on. But if you leave it to a level, only superficial science and interpretation start percolating. And after some time, you may have to worry about how to undo what the net work uh, all yeah. the paper has done. Okay, I think. You're, you're, if, if I've understood your question correctly, I, it's, I skipped it because I'm out of time. But uh, one of the problems is if we don't have anybody who knows how to reduce data or build telescopes, there's not going to be anybody to build the next generation telescope. Is that more or less what you're saying? You, you've, got to have, you've got to have experts in all stages of the process. And this, is, this process on its own will not produce those. No, the Twitter and the other kind of uh, networks run by some kind of a commercial. Uh, and there's no way to check what has gone in is authentic and there's no very good if anybody can write command and so on, there is a possibility not so correct facts getting you know, published much deeper before it could be stopped. And that means there is a danger in uh, that yeah. kind of a science. Yeah. So, so you, you're saying because of potential problems in the data that they're working with, or so, so it, it imposes more of a load on the people producing the databases to make sure they get it right. You've got to have good quality control in there and things. So I've, I've skimmed over a whole load of issues like that. Okay, but so it's clearly, going to be easy. clearly plenty more to discuss. Let's uh, break for uh, our last afternoon tea discussion. Um, I guess come back at uh, 4 o'clock for the final session.